Please turn in your Bibles to Acts uh, chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. We have been going through the book of Acts for uh, a few weeks. I'll, just, I'll say it that way. Uh, and uh, we, I gave you one phrase that highlights uh, the book of Acts so that you could kind of remember. And since we're beginning a new chapter and I didn't give you a letter from the last time, if you've been here before, you know the routine. Let me give you this on the screen. This phrase summarizes the book of Acts, Holy Spirit working in the church. We said, without the Holy Spirit, we're just, we're just beating the drum. We're just doing all this in our own efforts. But it's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. So it's the Holy Spirit and working where? In the church. And the church starts in the book of Acts in Acts chapter 2. Prior to that, God had worked with the nation of Israel and he kept working with the nation of Israel with Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, then Joseph. And he ministered through those prophets all the way up to the time of Christ. Jesus was born as a Jewish man and he came to his own people, Jewish people, and they didn't receive him. So, but he said then, to as many as received him, to them give you the right to become the sons of God, the children of the Lord. And so those became uh, Gentile people by and large. And so God hasn't forgotten about the Jewish people. Romans 9, 10, 11 says, has God forgotten the Jewish people? No, not at all. He's still working in their lives and is going to do his work with them. But he said, okay, let me work in the church over here. And so beginning in Acts chapter 2, the church gets started. The Holy Spirit comes and indwells people, and now we have a church with gifts and people ministering to one another in that wonderful way. So it's the Holy Spirit working in the church. When we started this, I took these letters. There are 28 of them. And I said there are 28 chapters in the book of Acts. And let's use every letter to be with each chapter of the book of Acts. So chapter one, let's use the letter H. And then I said to you, read the book of Acts and see if you can summarize chapter one, beginning with the letter H. And then chapter two, summarize it with beginning with the letter O. Chapter three, the letter L. I gave you some. You're not gonna remember what I give you, but if you do your own, you'll probably remember them better. But we said that the H would stand for hold still. Don't go anyplace. They were so anxious to leave Jerusalem. The Lord's alive. Let's go tell everybody. He said, hold still. You don't have what you need yet. The Holy Spirit hasn't come to your life. So the H was hold still. Stay in Jerusalem. The letter O, we said, let's chapter two. God begins to have this outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church and on the lives of people. When that happened, they started to go out and the letter L stood for the lame man was healed. And they went, wow, Jesus is gone, but we still have this power. And God used that to demonstrate his power to those people and people got saved. And the disciples got more bold and they started to preach everywhere. In chapter four, the letter Y was the Jewish leadership said to the disciples, you stop preaching about Jesus. The church continued to grow. A couple of people, Ananias and Sapphira, thought they would lie and say they sold all their property and give it all to the Lord. And so chapter five, I had to reverse it instead of Ananias and Sapphira. I said Sapphira and Ananias were judged by the Lord for lying to him. The church continued to grow and people said, hey, I'm being overlooked. What about me? What about me? And so the P stood for providing deacons and disputing. Then Stephen came on the scene in chapter seven and he preached in a powerful way. And some of the Jewish people became very irate and they killed him. So irate Jewish leaders killed Stephen. By the time you get to chapter 8, the R stands for reaching beyond Jerusalem. They were in Jerusalem. Now they're starting to go out from beyond Jerusalem and into Samaria. Chapter 9, in Damascus, 
Saul's life is changed and it becomes, it moves towards Paul. Chapter 10, for the first time, it was time to include the Gentiles in the church. Before that, it was just mainly Jewish people because it started in Jerusalem. And the people got upset. Wait a minute. Oh, wait, hold it. We're not even supposed to eat with Jewish people or with Gentile people. And so they, they were a little upset about that. So let me just put all those on the screen so you have those. If you've been here, you've probably written some of these down, or if you don't have time to copy them today, you might go on our website and just pull up one of the sermons that maybe we've done this in a review. Chapter 11, let me slide that over. Working in the church. Worship with the Gentiles is now defended in chapter 11. They said, wait a minute, God's reaching those people. Chapter 12, Peter's thrown in prison, and you have this, oh, outbreak from prison. And so let me just put on here, outbreak from prison in chapter 12. Peter gets out of prison and goes to the house, and Rhoda says, ah, Peter's at the door. Chapter 13, they start the very first missionary journey. They had three missionary journeys in the book of Acts. First one starts in Acts chapter 13. The second one st starts in Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 13, the R stands for reaching to the ends of the earth. Once they start reaching to the ends of the earth, Paul and Barnabas are on this trip with John Mark. They go up into Galatia. And in Galatia, the people are going, wow, I'm amazed. God is so good. But they were confused. Why, why, what's so they had this kindness mixed with confusion. And they were trying to comprehend what God was doing in that case. Chapter 15, they all get back to Jerusalem because now they say, wait a minute, we really need to finalize this. How are Gentile people saved? Do they have to get circumcised just like the Jewish people did? Do they have to keep the dietary laws? Do they have to do... So they investigate law versus grace. And Peter concludes and he says, we conclude that the Gentiles are saved by faith and grace alone. Chapter 16, they go on the next missionary journey and Paul gets all the way to Troas and as he's right against the edge of Troas, he, see, he has a vision from the Lord. It happens at night and God says, come over to Macedonia. He sees a man of Macedonia. He said, come over and help us. And so it happened at night, and it was the vision of the Lord, so I called it night vision. Go to Macedonia, night vision. Chapter 17, we said there are three cities they ministered in, Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens. They had different responses. The majority of chapter 17, though, was about Athens. And Paul was preaching a sermon there. And he said, I went and you had idols here and idols here and idols here. And I noticed that they were to the un unknown God. And so chapter 17, let's call it getting to know the unknown God. Chapter 18, it starts out, he left Athens and went to Corinth. And in Corinth, he worked with a couple of people that you find woven throughout scripture the rest of his ministry. Aquila and Priscilla. And so the I in 18 is in Corinth with Aquila and Priscilla. Okay, that brings you up to date. Let's go on. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Let me give you a, a map of the countries that surround the areas where ministry uh, occurred during the missionary journeys. You can see Italy over here to the left, the upper left on the screen. And Paul ends up in Italy, in Rome, at the end of the book of Acts. You see the Black Sea at the top here? See the square just at the southern edge of the Black Sea? That's Pontus. And that's where Aquila was from. He was from Pontus, but he ended up in Italy. He was kicked out of Italy because Claudius had kicked all the Jews out of Italy. And then they went to Greece. Okay, let me highlight uh, Greece here and let's zoom in on this area of the map because that's where we are in Acts chapter 18. Here's Corinth. This whole region is Greece. One section of it is kind of separate from that. That's the Peloponnesus Peninsula. So, but it's still connected. It's a little peninsula. And you see Italy way over to the upper left here. 
as background to what you need to know about Corinth, all the trade that was coming from Italy and going all the way over to Turkey had to pass one of two ways to get there. Look at the screen this way. You could leave Italy and go through the Gulf of Corinth and go to Athens. Or you could leave Italy and go all the way around the southern tip of Greece and come in. But if you went that southern route, it was roughly 200 miles longer, and it was rough sea. And so usually what they would say to somebody if they're going to go on that tour, on that, on that cruise area with the cargo, make sure your will's done before you go on this trip. Because often the ships would be broken apart and they lose the cargo. Now, if you were going to ship your goods from Italy over to Turkey or over into Athens, don't you think you'd ask the question to the merchant of the ship, how, how do you go? Which route do you take? Oh, I, I go through the Gulf of Corinth. Oh, okay, good. My cargo's safe. I'll ship with you. They say, well, it's a little more expensive. You say, well, why is that? It's shorter, it's less time? Because there's some extra work. And I'll show you why. Let's do this. Let's zoom in on just this area. Okay? Here's Corinth again, Greece. The peninsula, this uh, area as you're coming out, out of Italy and across this Gulf of Corinth. And you get to this area right here, which is a significant area. Let me uh, show it to you this way. This little area, let me put two little lines right there. It's like a little stranglehold. We would call it a bottleneck. When traffic kind of gets all bottled up, when it goes from... Uh, let me show it this way. When it goes from eight lanes down to two, what happens? It's, it's, it's crowded. Now, let me even say it. Well, let me sh show it to you this way. This, all the trade that came from east to west, from Turkey on over to Italy, would pass through Corinth. This little isthmus that's right there that I've highlighted is only four miles wide. Corinth occupied the whole area across that strip. So any traffic going west, any traffic going east, passed through there. In addition, any traffic from the north of Greece to the south or south of the north passed through that bottleneck. So you think it's blocked up on the 405 when you get on it? I'd hate to be in this area when ships are trying to pass through because the only way they could get the cargo moving was to go through these ship areas. Now let me do this. Let's take a satellite, zoom in on this area, this whole region where he's ministering to in, in his second missionary journey. As we zoom on it, here's Athens and Corinth, some 40 miles apart. Let's look at Corinth from Athens for a moment. See it there? Now, as you zoom into this area, this whole area right here to the left is Corinth. Got it? And Corinth is the only city in the world that could boast of having two seaports on two different seas. So they had one in Sancria, where Paul had his head shaved. Remember that? It's going to come up later on in the, in the text before he goes to Ephesus. The other one is Lechium, which is on the Gulf of Corinth. Here is the area that is the Isthmus area, this bottleneck area, and it's where you get the Isthmus Games, I-S-T-H-M-U-S, the Isthmus Games that were done every other year, just almost like the Olympics. This area that I've just highlighted did not exist when Paul was there. I mean, the area did. The canal didn't exist. Okay, let me show you a picture of the canal. This is what it looks like today. Some 75 feet deep all the way down, cut through all that stone. Because before, it was nothing but rock. So when you said, how are you going to take my goods? Oh, I'm going to go through the Gulf. Well, when they got to the Gulf area and they stopped at the isthmus, then what'd they have to do? 
unload every stinking thing from the ship, carry it those four miles across, put it in another ship, and take it on from there. So the guy said, this is going to cost you a little more, but you won't lose it. Now, in some cases, the ships weren't so massive that they would leave the ship all packed up and they had some skids that they would drag and push the ships four miles to the other side of the isthmus and do the work. It's to that city that Paul starts to come in. Let me show you, uh, let, me, let me tell you, this, was, this canal was started in 1881, completed in 1893. It's roughly four, a little under four miles across it. Let me give you some other pictures of it today. Isn't that a gorgeous shot of today? And you can see the, the sea line uh, is lower, and then it goes up high as they go through. They put uh, three or four bridges across there. Trains go across that area. It had to be high so that the ships, the larger ships, could get through without having to have some kind of draw bridges and stuff like that. But, and I wish they could have gotten pictures of you for you to see, but they also have a hydro uh, bridge, a hydraulic bridge that, that goes, lowers under the water, completely under the water, on the, on the ends, and comes back up out of the water so people can walk across or ride their bicycles across uh, so that they can still get the ships through and people can still quickly get across uh, in that area. Here's just another shot of as they head through that canal. Here's what it probably looked like more often, tugboats pulling larger things through that area because as the larger ships, you don't want to stir up so much there. And some of the ships, like the cruise ships that they have today, can't fit through there. So let's zoom in. We're on the Saronic Sea right now. Let's go right to the canal area there. Let's swing around now to the Gulf side and you can see the mountains in the background because it's significant. Here's Corinth today, and here is the Areopagus, uh, or the Acropolis in Corinth. If I said, where's the Acropolis? Most people think Athens. And there is an Acropolis there. But an Acropolis just means a large, high area of a city. Here is the one in Corinth, called Acrocorinth. And what's significant about this is what they did on top of that area. 2,000 feet above sea level, right against the, the network there of Corinth. They had the Temple of Aphrodite, or in the Roman words, Z, uh, Venus, the goddess of love. And at that temple, at the time of Paul, they had 1,000 female slaves. And what they would do is those female slaves at night would leave the temple area and come down into the city and prostitute themselves. Now, what kind of people were passing through that city? Drunken, what kind of people? Not Marines? <laughs> Drunken sailors. East to west traffic, everything's moving through there and a thousand prostitutes coming into that city night after night, taking their money back up into the temple area, and Paul's coming into that city. Here are the ruins of that city today with the uh, mountain of the temple in the background. Here's a better shot of that, uh, the temple of Apollo with the Acrocorinth in the background. And here's a close-up of it, and you can see the, the wall across the top area there. They're still in place. Might be good for you to know that Corinth was destroyed as a city in 146 BC. They killed most of the men, sold the women and children as slaves, and it wasn't rebuilt again until 44 BC under Julius Caesar before he was assassinated. So when Paul came to the city, it's, it, he was there, well, let's say somewhere between uh, 40 uh, in 50 AD, so it wasn't even 90 years old in a city at that point. It was just back on the map again. You need to know some things about Corinth uh, to know why Paul did what he did. Paul visited Corinth on his second missionary journey. Remember his first one, chapters 13 and 14. 
Second missionary journey, chapter 16, 17, 18. So let me give it to you, starting Acts 18, verses 1 through 3. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, remember on the Black Sea, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, a synagogue ruler, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be what? Afraid. What does that tell you about Paul? Why did God, do you, do you tell people that aren't afraid, don't be afraid? You take the people who are fearful and say, don't be afraid. That's going to be okay. So what do you know about Paul in Corinth? He's fearful. And God has to come to him and say, don't be afraid. He goes on, keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I'm with you and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half to teach them the word of God. So what do we know about Corinth so far? Paul visited it on his second missionary journey. He lived in Corinth a year and a half. He met Aquila and Priscilla there. The Jews opposed him there. And lastly, something that we didn't read in the text is he wrote three and possibly four letters to them. We have 1 Corinthians, we have 2 Corinthians. But why do we say he wrote them three or four letters? Let me show you in the text. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, Paul writes and he says, I have written to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Okay, past tense, and I've done it. And so far in 1 Corinthians, he's not talking anything about not associating, associating with immoral people. So someplace he wrote it that we don't have. That just goes to show you that not everything that Paul wrote was scripture. But when he did write inspired by God, it was scripture and God protected it. So we don't have his first letter written to them. We do have the one that we call 1 Corinthians. Here's what he says in 2 Corinthians now, chapter 2 and verse 3. I wrote as I did so that when I came, I should not be distressed by those who ought to make me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy. That's verse 3. Verse 4, he says, For I wrote out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many what? Tears. We don't have a letter that he talks about all his tears. He talks about tears in 2 Corinthians, but he doesn't talk about it in 1 Corinthians. So either we don't have his letter of tears, or somehow we're not understanding that 1 Corinthians, our 1 Corinthians was his letter of tears. But we do have 2 Corinthians. So getting back, what do we know about Corinthians? These five things we've talked about. But let me even give you something else about first and second, uh, first Corinthians. Corinthians. He wrote first and second Thessalonians from Corinth. He also wrote the book of Romans from Corinth. Kind of a strange place to write such a great book in such an ungodly environment. But God just poured out where sin abounds, grace what? much more abounds. So sin was abounding in Corinth and God said, I'm just going to pour out my word on you. And he writes Romans from Corinth. But apart from all these things, there's something even more important that happened in Corinth that's not up here. Let me put it on the screen this way. 
Paul came to Corinth in weakness and fear. And how do we know that? Well, first of all, the Lord, while he was in Corinth, had to tell him what? Don't be what? Don't be afraid. But beyond that, when we go to the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 says, when I came to you, Paul is writing the Corinthians, he's going to give them uh, an opportunity to peek in. To when I came to you, here's what was going on in my heart. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and much what? Trembling. The Apostle Paul? Fearful? Look, here's what I'd like you to get. There will be times in our lives, just like Paul, that fear can grip us. You know, there are some people that they look like they have everything together all the time. And you think, do, do they ever make a mistake? Do they ever doubt? Do they ever get fearful? And once in a while when those people come to you, if they say, hey, uh, I need you to pray for me, you go, really? You have a problem? You? You have a problem? You look at them and, and if you're not careful, you almost sin by saying, hey, good. I was glad you had a problem. You're, you, you are like me, huh? Because they just seem like they have everything in place. But here's the Apostle Paul, and he was gripped by fear, and God said, don't be afraid. He said, I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much what? Trembling. Now let me put this on the screen. Notice the reason God allows us to fear. I don't think God, I know God doesn't cause us to fear for he says to us in his word, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of faith, love, strong mind. He hasn't given us that spirit of fear. But when we're fearful, God sometimes allows it for some reasons. Let me give you the first one. So we are open to be encouraged by others. You know, when you've got your act together and everything's going fine, you don't need other people. And other people know that you don't need them. But when you're falling apart a little bit and you say, hey, things aren't going well, can, can you? And that fear that comes in. Once in a while, somebody said to me this morning, hey, can you pray for me? There have been some cutbacks at work. I said, oh, how many are they cutting back? And they said, well, 1,500 people. I go, oh, that's a few. They have a little bit of fear set in. We had a couple in our church a number of years back. Uh, we'd be around the corner over there. Uh, and they were a part of that church at the time. They had uh, a couple of children. And one of their children, a little baby, died. Sids. Right about Christmas time. I think it was December 24th, but I, uh, my memory is kind of foggy on that. But it was sometime between the 24th and New Year's. So every time Christmas came around, it just slapped them again. And again, because you can't come to that time of the year without remembering. She got pregnant again. The baby came. They said, the baby's going to sleep right in our bedroom. Right beside our bed. Why? Because of fear. They said, we're going to do everything. Sometimes fear motivates us to do some things. Some of you people would say, well, I wouldn't want the baby in my room because you need to get sleep at night and you think everything will be okay. But you lose a baby and then fear steps in. And then you're willing to take encouragement from other people. Let me show it to you in the text. Acts 18, 2 and 3. There in Corinth, Paul met a Jew named a Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. 
Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Now, can I remind you that, that Paul, at this point, was all by himself? Remember on a second missionary journey, who joined him on the second missionary journey? Silas. And as they headed out on the missionary journey in Lister and Derby, they picked up a young intern named Timothy, who Paul later wrote and said, let no man despise thy youth but be thou an example of the believer. So they had Silas and Timothy. They get up to uh, Philippi. Silas and Paul are thrown in prison. They're singing praise at midnight to God. They get over to Berea. Things start to fall apart. The brothers say, let's get Paul out of Berea and down to Athens. And Silas and Timothy stay in Berea. Right? Now Paul's in Athens by himself. Then he goes to Corinth and he's by himself. And there are 1,000 prostitutes hanging around. Don't you want to have some accountability? Don't you want to have some help? Don't you want to have some encouragement? There's no church. There's no Bible. And God says, hey, uh, let's, let's tap Aquila, Priscilla. I need to get you out of Italy. I need to get you over to help Paul. And they come over. And they're great encouragements. So much so that when Paul wrote about them later on in his life, in the book of Romans, which was, which was written where? In Corinth. Where he met Aquila and Priscilla. And now they're no longer with him at the end of Romans. So in the end of Romans chapter 16, they say this in verses 3 and 4. Greet! Aquila, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, they risk their lives for me. Don't you want to have co-workers that are that way? After all, what were they? They were tent makers. And what was he? A tent maker. And what did he do? They worked together in Corinth making tents. And what could he say about them? They risked their lives for me. He came to Corinth, how? Weak, fearful, and Trembling, and who did God send to encourage him? Because he was weak and trembling and fearful, he was willing to listen. And they became his friends. But those aren't the only people that ended up there. Let me go on. Acts 18, verses 4 and 5. Every Sabbath, Paul reasoned in the synagogue. Why not every day? Every time he went to some place, where'd he go? Synagogue. Why didn't he work? Well, why didn't he uh, witness every day and reason with him in the Sabbath every day? Because he, he had to work. And what was he doing at working? The verses just before this? Making tents. But now, here's what the text says. Remember, he left Silas and Timothy up in Berea. Here's what the text says. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came to Macedonia, everything changed. Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. Why? Why was that possible? He had to work before so he could make some income. And he was all by himself before. So what happened? We know from the book of Philippians and Thessalonians that both the church at Thessalonica and the church at Philippi sent gifts to him via Silas and Timothy. And now he had money and he could serve the Lord full time. Do you understand? That's why we, we support missionaries. We send people so they can serve the Lord. Is it okay for them to be tent makers? Sure, be a tent maker. Go and teach English as a second language somewhere in the mission field. Go and serve in some other way and be a, a godly person in that environment. But if God starts opening up a ministry and more people get saved and things start to happen and he, he needs pastors or he needs leaders, then God will provide money when that time is necessary. And so Paul was encouraged because they came and they received gifts from him. Look, I don't know when fear grips your life, but it can, just like it did Paul. And there are reasons that it happens. The first one was, so we're open to be encouraged by others. That you don't have your act together in such a way that you don't need anybody else's help. Secondly, so God can give us new direction. 
Now, I want to be cautious here because I don't want you to think every time you're fearful about something, oh, must be God wants me to leave here and, and do this. Must be God wants me to do a change in this. Sometimes God wants you to just press through because I told you God hasn't given you the spirit of fear, but he allows it sometimes to redirect our lives. Here's what the text says. Verse six, <clears throat> but when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the, what kind of people? Gentiles. What kind of a person was he? He was Jewish. He wasn't even supposed to associate with Gentiles. Before this, they weren't even allowed to eat, to the, eat at the house of a Gentile. And now he's saying, okay, new direction. I'm a little fearful of my Jewish brothers over here. They've been abusive. And he turns and he says this. This is verse six. Look what he says in verse seven or what it says about him. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue ruler and his entire household believed in the Lord and many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. But he left what? The synagogue. He's a Jewish, he's a nice Jewish boy who is also a rabbi. He was leaving everything he'd ever been close to. And God used that fear to help motivate him to move him on. Look, fear can grip us just like it grips them. And there are some reasons. The first one is to open us up to be encouraged by other people. And God could use other people in our lives. Secondly, so God can give us new direction. Thirdly, so we will listen to God's voice. You know, we get so busy that you say, well, God doesn't speak the same way he used to speak. You know, he used to say, Samuel, Samuel, yes, Lord. I mean, he used to speak. You would freak out. I would really freak out if, <laughs> if he started, you know, I hear voices. And, well, I, I have heard voices. No. <laughs> It's my wife, so she's saying, get over here, let's get this done. No, you know that God doesn't speak in the same way today, but he still speaks through his word. He speaks uh, through your parents. Uh, he speaks through uh, messages in the service. Sometimes he even speaks through your boss. He looks at you and says, you're fired. <laughs> and you say, oh, okay. I guess God wants me to have a new direction. Do you understand? You don't say, hey, wait a minute, have you talked this over with God? God says, I want you to submit to those who are in authority over you. So if your boss is over you and he says, I want this done, who's speaking? Unless he's asking you to violate something from scripture and then you say it's better to obey God rather than man. So he allows fear sometimes so we'll listen to God's voice. Let me show it to you in the text. Verse nine, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. So we know that he was a fearful person. He's already told us when he came to Corinth, I, I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling. And one night the Lord spoke to him. And what did he say? Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For what? I am with you. Is that any different? God spoke to him and said, I'm with you. God spoke to us from his word. Is it any different than Matthew 28, 19 and 20? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always. He said to the Apostle Paul, I'm with you. And he says, to you, he ups the ante. It's not, I'm with you. His, to you, he's saying, I'm with you always. I have to put up with you 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, 366 on leap year. I don't get a break. I'm with you always. But you know, you're so involved with television and radio and Facebook and, oh, I'm sorry. 
I'm stepping on my toes at the same time I'm stomping, no, I'm stepping on yours. Because we're so busy with everything that you really have very little time to hear the voice of God through his word. Look, there are times that fear can grip our hearts. Here's the reason. So we are open to encouragement by others so God can give us new directions. So we'll listen to God's voice. Let me give you the last one. So we will rely on God's power. Our tendency is to think, oh, I can do this. I, I've been trained to do this. You know, you can do it all, but if you do it without God's power, that's all it is, just you doing it. It's not by might or by our strength, but by his what? Spirit, says the Lord. It's by his spirit. We can flap all our all our arms we want. We can run and do all the work we want. We can spend all the time we want. But if we're doing it in our own strength, it won't last. You want to have a lasting change on your kids' lives? You want to have a lasting change on your grandchildren's lives? Then do things in the power of God's spirit rather than your own. Now, we're not taught this in Acts 18, 1 to 11. He tells us this in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 and 5. But do you remember 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1, 2, and 3? In 1, 2, and 3, it's where he said, And when I came to you, I came how? In weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling. And so in verses 4 and 5, he follows it up with this. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but, were, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. So that why do we keep teaching God's word here? We don't try to tell you some fantastic philosophies and stories and stuff like that. We just keep hammering back God's word, God's word, God's word, because it's quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It'll cut through to the hardness of my heart and the hardness of your heart. It'll open you up. It'll lay you bare. It'll get you to do what you know you should but don't want to do, to forgive those who persecute you, to go after those who insult you, to It'll help you to do what God says. Turn the other cheek. It'll do what God says to do. Ephesians 4.32, be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Because it's God's word, and it's powerful. And it'll, it'll cause you to do what you can't do apart from it. The question I have for you today is, have you been able to lay your fears at the Lord's feet? And have you been um, blessed by responding to your fear in a godly way? How did Paul end 2 Corinthians? He said, oh, I, I had a thorn in my flesh, and I asked the Lord to take it away. Three times I said, Lord, take it away, and he said, no, my grace is sufficient. Therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities for your strength is made perfect in my weakness. How did he come to the Corinthians? In weakness and in fear and much trembling. And he said, but if I come to you this way, then you know that it's not me that's done the work. It's God's power that's done it all. You can be fearful. It's not from the Lord. But when you are fearful, God can say, okay, I better send somebody in to help. I better send the troops in, the Aquilas and the Priscillas, the, the Silas and the Timothys. Okay, I need to give them some new direction. Okay, I need to let them see that it's my power and not their strength that's going to do the work anyway. Let's ask God to take our fears 
and to do the work in our lives that he wants to accomplish because of it. Let's pray. Father, we want your Holy Spirit to rain down on our lives so that as uh, your people, we live the way you want us to live. Father, I pray for the youth in our services today that your word could let them see that when they have fear, you are there to give them direction. I pray for your people before me that you would resolve their fears and give them the spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Let us hear your voice. Do you want us to do new direction? Father, would you use us? Maybe you're wanting to use us to encourage somebody that's fearful today. Help us to be an Aquila and a Priscilla, a Silas or a Timothy to them today. For we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.